Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And today I'm reviewing Whistle Mountain by Bezier Games, a game designed by Scott Caputo and Luke Laurie, and this one is a mess. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's it's a bit of a mess. So let's let's dive into this one. So this game has a lot going on. I am definitely not seeking to teach you how to play this game. Not that any of my videos should ever be considered a teach so much as a general idea of how to play, but more specifically in this case, there is a lot going on and it's hard to fully encapsulate everything without becoming, well, way too tedious. So, so let's go for the high level overview of this game. Whistle Mountain is effectively going to be a worker placement game, although specifically a, you know, blimp, air machine, thingamajiggy placement game. You're going to be placing these down on the board in order to take different benefits in the game, ultimately with the goal of achieving the most points. Uh, end game score in this game can be in the range of 200 plus, doing a lot of different things in the game. So you're going to be trying to get points from generating them from engines, generating them from building different machines, generating them from moving your meeples onto these boards over here. You have these meeples over here, these are your workers, and you're going to be slowly moving them onto the board, which we'll explain a bit more, and then from the board onto these various slots where they can score points there. There's going to be a lot of different things that give you points in the game. These various gears that give you these, well, abilities in the game will also earn you points. Like I said, the machines will give you points. There's this is a lot of different things in this game that will earn you points, and you're trying to do so in the most efficient way possible. Past that, it's going to be worker placement, like I said. You're going to be taking these blimps down and then putting them in one of a few locations, either around the outside of the board, so you can see over here, if I put a blimp here, I'll be able to draw cards. I can either draw one card, or I can discard any resource of my choice to draw two cards, or discard any two resources to draw any three cards. You can go over here, which is how you get these gears. These gears are going to slot into your player board over here, so I can go ahead and gather this gear. It's going to cost me two coal, but then every single round, I can discard a card to get two coal. It's called the manifest. I'll slot that down over here, fits beautifully in there. Once you have six gears, well, you're, that's it. That's going to be your upgrade path for the game. So you can go over here to get a, an ability and, of course, the points shown on it over there. You can go over here where you can trade in, where you can, first of all, you can take a polyomino tile, or you can trade in whistles, which are a resource, to get additional polyomino tiles. You can go over here where you can go ahead and take one of your workers from the Whirlpool and move them up in the, in the engine over here, which is good because every worker here at the end of the game is going to lose you five points. You could go over here in order to build a machine. You pay the resources shown on the top of the machine, sorry, you pay the resources shown on the sidebar over here, and you earn that machine, goes into your personal supply, and later you can put it on the board. That's going to be true for these medium machines and these small machines, just different resource costs. And then the big one, placing it on the main board, because you're building out this main board in Whistle Mountain. You're going to effectively be building out this entire little grid here. It's going to be developed by the players, and it's going to be done a few different ways. To start with, you're going to start the game with some of the scaffolding down in various places around the board. So let's just go ahead and paint a hypothetical picture where this is the scaffold situation on the board when the game begins, which I can barely see over here, but that's where am I going, I'm going too far down. So over here, that's going to be the board over there, and now we're locked in. Great. So at the beginning of the game, you can go ahead and place your blimps onto this area over here, and whatever the blimp touches is going to get you resources. That's the fun part of the game. So a big part of the fun is going to be placing your blimp down to get as much as possible. So in this case, I'm going to get one gold, one whistle, whistles all wild resource, and one gold. Additionally, I'll get one water because I'm touching this. Meanwhile, my opposing player, whatever it is, they may take their blimp, and they may go over here, locking in three water. Water is going to be very easy to come by early game because of these boards, as the game progresses a little harder. Now, that's that's just part of what's going on. But the fun will really progress as you actually start building out areas in the board, because once you have a fully covered area, you will have the opportunity when you with when you recall your workers, you'll have the opportunity to build various machines you've built. So perhaps I go ahead and I put down this machine over here. There we go. Over there. Awesome. Great. Well, now I'm going to be able to have another place to put our various blimps. So this blimp over here, when it goes on this machine, because your blimps cannot dock on the scaffold, but they can dock on the machines. Look, it's going to go ahead and give me one gold, one point, and then every resource it's touching. In general, in this game, touching machines and resources are going to be the fun of the game. So you're trying to slowly build out scaffolding, which is good, and also give you points, by the way. Then you're building up machines, which will be good, and also give you points, by the way. Then you're placing down blimps on top of those machines to generate more and more. Meanwhile, once your machines actually rise above the water level over here, so let's go ahead and just paint a hypothetical picture over here, where we have all these scaffoldings going up over here, and over here, and over here, and they don't have to be firmly built on anything, by the way, you can have an offshoot that goes like this or whatnot, but once you actually have a machine that is in any way overlaying the water line, as soon as that happens, you're going to move up the water line. You're going to take one of these water lines, any workers it covers are drowned, and it's going to go up, and boom, 
the water level rises. And again, it's going to keep happening. As the pressure builds, as the mountains start collapsing around you, as the snow starts melting, the water levels will keep on rising slowly but surely, ejecting blimps back to their home base when hit, covering and waterlogging machines such as they can't be built, and that's going to be what's going on there. Past that, past the whole worker placement thing, because you have three workers, place them out, at any point you can choose to take a recall turn. When you take a recall turn, you're going to be able to spend water, to, you're going to be able to take a build action, which either means building a machine or building scaffolding. Additionally, you can pay additional water to do that up to two more times, paying one water each time to get up to a total of three build actions. And then you can potentially move your workers. You can pay a gold to move your workers or pay two gold to recall one of your workers from the drowned area and put those workers on machines. And then when those workers are covered by other machines later, that's when they shift off to the side. So if I go ahead and I build a worker here, and then later we build this tile, and then later we build this machine, over here, once that happens, the worker shoots off to the side, landing on the scaffolding area next to them, being worth as many points as shown there, and taking whatever ribbon it is for an additional bonus whenever you so want. That's basically Whistle Mountain. Place your workers, place your blimps around the board, get the various benefits, upgrade your gears with over here, get cards. Cards are going to be very helpful, letting you break the sequence of flow a lot of times. So having a bunch of cards ready for an option here and there, very helpful. Get machines, get, get scaffolding, slowly bump up the thing until eventually one player wins. It becomes a bit of a mess pretty quickly because... The vast variety of machines in this game is ridiculous. Every single machine, and this stack of machines you see here, this is just part of it. I couldn't even take all of it, so half the machines are still off to the side. But you're going to have stacks and stacks of machines, of which you will never see half those machines in a single game. You'll see a bunch of them, don't get me wrong. But you will not see a bulk of the machines. So every single game is a different hodgepodge of abilities. Abilities that are open to any single person. As soon as I build a machine, it's open to everyone. The abilities in this game are just everywhere. There's machines that give you these just trade in different things. You know, oh, boom, you want whistles? Great, this machine over here, that's going to give you whistles and stars every single time. Well, now that you have whistles, this machine will you trade in whistles to get those gears for the permanent upgrades. Speaking of powers and abilities, all these gears, those upgrades that slot into your player board, those are all going to give you some sort of additional advantage that you have that others don't. Maybe for you, you have iron lung. These pieces of iron are now wild, so you want to get as much iron as possible because for you, it's more flexible than other resources. Meanwhile, you also have your starting ability. That's going to go over here. And yes, again, you have an giant stack of starter abilities that you will do you'll need multiple games before you can even go through those. That's a ton of fun there. The cards, the cards let you break the rules in any number of different ways, giving you, oh, look at that. I can trade two wild resources to any resources for a cog. That's great. Oh, look at that. I got two whistles. Just tons of fun stuff. Maybe you want to withdraw your blimps. Maybe you want to get an extra machine. They will break the rules in a variety of different ways. Maybe your secret door, you want to move a worker up or down and just get an additional benefit. There's so many different things you can do in this game that it becomes a, a bastion, I think that's a good word, a bastion of of abilities, of options on the table in front of you. This is worker placement where the only thing worse than having your perfect spot taken by this player going here and activating this machine and that machine, well, I mean, that might sound bad, but you can go in any of a dozen other different places in this game that may not be exactly what you wanted to do, but they're still going to let you do a lot of things. They're still going to let you do just tons of stuff. You're going to feel powerful in this game as you place down place down your blimps, getting both resources from the board as well as activating. Like, you know, hey, good, fine. I'll go over here. I'll get a whistle on a star and still get one water. That's okay. I'm okay with that because there's a million different options on the table. The gameplay manages to feel incredibly unique, bringing you this tableau building as you build up your player board, while also building up the general play area where everyone's actions get progressively more powerful as the game develops, while being a polyomino slash worker placement slash engine building slash any who knows how many slashes there are in this gameplay experience. The worker placement is just so powerful, so many things you can do, and there's, there's always things to do because I'm just even talking about the central board, but Around the whole area of the board, there's always something you do. You have three workers before you have to recall. And what you do with those three workers, it's never a question of finding things to do. It's a question of, well, I, there's 15 things I want to do with my three workers. Which of those 15 things will I choose to do at the moment? So when someone blocks your spot, when someone goes to take cards, when you want to take cards, that's okay. There's a million other things you can do. So this game manages to feel tight and challenging and yet not punishing 
all at the same time. Everything in this game feels rewarding. And it's just a question of what's the most rewarding at any given point. And the card play is just, it's, the card play is, is key because there's only one spot there, but I think it's essential to go there when you can, trade in resources that you don't currently need because you'll always be resources you don't currently need. You are limited to four of each resource, which means you're going to start capping those out as you develop your little engine and trading on those resources that you have greater access to in order to get a bunch of cards, which you can then trade in for other abilities or just timing. The cards will allow you to have the flexibility of timing. They will give you build actions when you otherwise wouldn't have them. They'll give you recall actions, which will help improve your timing. They will give you gears and machines and all these things at times and situations that are convenient for you. So make sure to get those cards. But that's what Whistle Mountain is. It's a it's just the sandbox experience of a million different ways to drive your way towards the end game. Ways that it's about finding those combinations, it's about finding the pathway of the buildings, perhaps building out the various buildings that will help you in that engine, but understanding that at any given point, there's also a degree of cutthroatness in this game. There's a degree of someone else taking your machine, someone else building where you planned on building, someone else getting to these rewards on the sidebar and slotting in their workers for high scoring bonuses faster than you have an opportunity to do so. This game is a sandbox that is immensely fun, very challenging, very tight, a lot to go on here. As far as things I don't like, because I mean, if it sounds like I like the game, I, I do like the game quite a bit. But as far as things I don't like, the only, I only have one nitpick. I really try to think it through. I have complaints that you might potentially have, and we'll get to that. But for me personally, when I'm looking at Whistle Mountain and trying to be critical of it, I really enjoy this game. There's a lot that I just, it's, there's just, it's just so open. It's so open and letting me do so many things that I have fun with it every single time. So the one nitpick I do have, the complaint that I'll bring to the table is, and I have a horrible selection of tiles here. So let's go ahead and find a different selection of tiles. Let's say this 12 over here. And let's say, let me see if I can find something even cheaper than an eight. I can't necessarily. So we'll go ahead and we'll go with an eight. So we have the 12 and we have the eight. Basically, when you're building out these machines, okay, you're going to be building machines during the game, you're going to be paying resources to do that and putting them on the board in such a way that everyone has access to those machines. Well, all the machines come with variable bonuses that you get upon building them the first time. So for instance, in this case, if you build the archives, then you'll get 12 points. If you build the controller, you'll get 8 points. But no matter which one you build, everyone has access to that ability. That's the only part of the game that I have a nitpick about. Because... I'm sure you could argue strategically that you should build a machine that best fits whatever you're trying to do, but in theory, everyone has access to the same engine over here past whatever distinguishing characteristics you have on your player board that make you stand out. And so past that exception, past your unique player abilities, most of the time, just take the thing that gives you more points because ultimately, the rest of you are all going to have the same engine to work with. Your incentive to building the machines is not that they exist inherently because again someone's going to build the machines but rather the main incentive in my opinion is going to be getting the chunk of points that come along with it and then yes providing something that everyone can do so i didn't love the fact that there was often a tile i wanted to build and yet i chose the tile that gave me more goodies for me rather than the tile that would benefit the general engine because we're all going to have the same engine to work with so i want those four extra points that's the, the only real nitpick I have. Things, sometimes things I wanted to do didn't seem like the optimal choice given the just the incentive in points. Past that, I have no real complaints myself. I do have things that might make Whistle Mountain not a great game for you. And to begin with, it's going to be the thing I touched upon at the beginning of this video. It is a messy game. That wide openness that I love, that fact that there's always somewhere to go with your machines, that no matter what people do to get in your way, there is something else, there is some option or placement that they didn't consider that you will find that will work well for you that's great but the game can be messy there's so much going on and every single game is going to be a different experience as the combination of abilities of machines of gears of of starting player powers all those things will combine into a different experience every single time and that might make this game a little overwhelming for you it might make this game a little messy for you it might make this game just not what you are potentially looking for it's simultaneously not a you know beat em up ameritrash game nor is it in what i would consider an a quote unquote elegant euro it's a Euro game, and it's a lot of fun, but it's not... The word elegant doesn't spring to mind when I think of Whistle Mountain. The word fun, powers, combos, abilities, and literally just an open sandbox of doing whatever you want, that's what kind of springs to mind for myself. And then lastly, I would say that same aspect that goes into the mess and the abilities and all that also leads to a healthy degree of AP in this game, of analysis paralysis, of some players just sitting there taking way too long on their turn, especially... Especially if you just took the spot that they were planning on going to, because that's, now we have to hold our horses. I gotta sit there, sit here and think through what 
combination of things I'm going to do because you just took my spot. It's not my fault that I'm taking so long. It's your fault. So you're just going to sit there and wait next time. Don't take my spot. Okay. Okay. So that, that can happen in this game. It depends on your group. For our group, I would say we generally are aware of the, the effect and the, the impact we have upon others. And so we allow ourselves that time, but not so much time. At a certain point, you just take a move, optimal or not, and move on with your life. But if you are someone that is prone to having an AP player in your group, someone who just takes their time on moves that they need to min-max the way towards perfection, this is not a game you want to play with people who feel the need to min-max the way towards perfection. If you've played five tribes and there's that one person in your group where like, I will never play five tribes with them, it takes way too long, well then I would argue put Whistle Mountain in that category as well. Past that, that's all I really have as far as critiques for myself and or for others. I, I like this game, I like this engine, which brings us to final thoughts. Whistle Mountain is an amazingly fun experience. I, I, I adore the, this, the overwhelming amount of options that this game can take you in. For me, it is a four to five. It's not, it's not a five out of five. And I did wrestle with this. It's one thing that I could see it growing over time. I could see it uh, continuing to develop as a game as I get in more and more plays. Where I am right now, something about that, that mess leads to a slight lack of elegance where I, I can't give it the highest accolade for myself. And again, I, it's, consider this one of those times where just my own independent, opinion and bias is fil filtering in here. Something with the game does not go to the immediate top of the class, so to speak, for myself, but I really like this engine. I really like this game. I really like the powers, the abilities, the gears. I mean, I'm somebody that every single time I've played this, I've gotten like five or six gears. I try to build out all my gears as much as possible because I like the powers. I then go to the cards and get as many cards as possible so that I can break the game through the card play. Then I try to get these awards because they're all just different things that let me let me break the game. Not so much break the game, so much as just having fun within the engine. I want to get things. I want to turn things into other things. I want to get an ability that gives me more cards than build out a executive archives over here that will let me turn cards into other cards or any number of different things in this game. Whistle Mountain is, is a, is a sandbox of a Euro experience and one that I adore. From Bezier Games, Scott Caputo and Luke Laurie and a game that I highly recommend. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. and I hope you have a good one.